Chapter 7, Part 2 of The Nightland by William Hope Hodgson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Nightland. Chapter 7 The Nightland, Part 2. Now I moved not for a time, but was made stiff by the greatness of my fear. Yet I was presently aware that the silent ones came not towards me, but stood quiet, as that they did mind not to slay me, if but I did keep from that place. And there grew therefrom a little courage into mine heart, and I obeyed my spirit, and took an hold of my strength and went slowly backward in the bushes, and presently I was come a long way off, yet troubled and disturbed, and very strict to my going. And I made a great circling about that place where the plain of the silent ones did come outward, and so did gain to the northwest, and was thence something the happier in my heart, and went easily and oft upon my feet, yet making a strong watching to every side. And so I came at the last to a time when I had walked through four and twenty weariful hours, and was eager that I should come to a safe place for my sleep yet did lack a happy belief of safety, in that I had come twice and nigh to so grim trouble, and unsure I was that I did not be secretly pursued in the night. And this you shall believe to be a very desperate feeling, and a plight to make the heart sick, and to long with a great longing for the safety of that mine home. Yet had I put myself to the task, and truly I did never cease to the sorrowful remembering of that utter despair that had sounded to me plain in the last calling of mine own love, out of all the mystery of the night. And but to think upon this was to grow strong in the spirit, yet to have a fresh anxiousness that I did the more surely keep my life within me, and so come to that made salvation. Now, as you shall mind, I had spied the shine of certain fire-holes somewhat to the northward, and had thought to make thereabouts a place for my sleep, for in truth there was a bitterness of cold in all the air of the night that did surround me, and I was warmed nigh to a slow happiness by thinking upon a fire to lie beside, and small wonder, as you shall say. And I made presently a strong walking unto that place where did glow in the night the shine of the fire-holes, as I did well judge them to be, and so was like to have come over swiftly upon my death, as you shall presently see, for as I came anigh to the first I perceived that the light came upward out of a great hollow among the moss-bushes, and that the fire-hole burned somewhere in the deep of the hollow, so that I did but look upon the shine thereof. Yet very eager was I to come to that warmth, and I made more of haste than care, as I did hint, and so came very swift to the top of the hollow, yet was still hidden by the kindness of the moss-bushes. And as I made to thrust forward out of the bushes, that I might look and go downward into the hollow, there rose up to me the sound of a very large voice, and deep and husky and the voice was a dreadful voice that did speak as that it said ordinary things, and in a fashion so monstrous, as that it were that a house did speak, and in verity this is a strange thing to say, yet shall it have the truth of my feelings and terror in that moment. And I drew back swiftly from discovering myself, and was then all feared to move, or to make to go more backward, lest that I should give knowledge that I was come anigh and likewise did I shiver lest that I was even then perceived. And so shall you have something of the utter fear that did shake me, and I abode there very quiet, and moved not for a very great space, but did sweat and shake, for there was a monstrous horridness in the voice that did speak. And as I crouched there within the moss-bushes, there came again the large voice, and it was answered by a second voice, and thereupon there arose, as it did seem, the speech of men that must have the bigness of elephants, and that did have no kindness in all their thoughts, but were utter monstrous. And the speech was slow, and it rose up out of the hollow, brutish and hoarse and mighty. And I would that I could make you hear it, and that you could but borrow mine ears for a little moment, and forthwith be shaken with that utter horror and an afraidness even as was I. 
but presently there was a very long quiet, and I ceased at last a little from mine over-fear. And later I did calm somewhat, so that I made to shift my position which was grown very uneasy. And there was still no sound from the hollow. Wherefore, having a little boldness and much curiousness, and these despite my great fearfulness, I put forth mine hand, very cautious, and did move the moss-bush a little from my face. And I went forward upon the earth, and did lie upon my belly, and was by this so close upon the edge of that place that I was able to look downwards. And you shall know that I peered down into that great hollow, and did see a very strange and horrid sight. For, in truth, there was a large fire-hole in the centre of that place, and all about the sides there were great holes into the slopes of the hollow, and there were great men laid in the holes, so that I might see a great head that did show out to my sight here, from one of those holes, and would seem to be that of a monstrous man heavy with sleep. And there I would see but the buttocks of another, as that he did curl himself inward to his brutish slumbering. And so was it all about, and to my memory there were maybe a score of these holes, yet had I not time to the counting, as you shall see. For after that I had made but a glance, as it were, at these sleeping and utter monstrous men, I perceived that there sat beyond the fire-hole three great men, and they were each greater than elephants, and covered a large part with a stiff and horrid hair that did be of a reddish seeming. And there were upon them great segs and warts, as that their skin had been hides that had never known covering. And there was between them the body of a mighty hound, so big as an horse, that they did skin. And I judged that this beast was one of those fearsome brutes which we did call the night-hounds. Yet as I should set down, they did nothing in that time in which I looked at them, but did sit each with a sharp and monstrous bloody stone in his fist, and did look to the ground, as that they heeded not the earth or the food that they did prepare, but did listen to some outward sound. And you shall know that this brought to me a very swift and sudden terror, for I perceived now the why of their long silence, for in verity they had an unease upon them, being subtly aware that one was an eye, even as are the brute beasts in this manner and kind, as all do know. And I made to draw back, and win unto safety, if indeed this thing were to be done. And as I moved me, it may be that I shook a little earth into the hollow, for there was indeed a little shifting of dry dust below me, as I did what, being very keen to hear by reason of my fright. And immediately did those three monstrous men look upward, and did seem to me to stare into mine eyes, as I did lie there hid amid the moss-bushes. And I was so put in fear that I did clumsily, and sent another siftering of dust downward, as I did strive to go backward swift and quiet from the edge. And all the time I did look through the bushes very fixedly into the eyes of the giants, and, lo, their eyes did shine red and green, like to the eyes of animals. And there rose up a roar from them that did nigh slay my soul with the horridness of the noise, and at that roaring all the giants that did lie in the holes did awake and began to come outward into the hollow. Now I was surely lost and given over to destruction, for they had possessed me immediately, but that in that moment, as I went backward, the earth gave behind me, and I fell into a hole among the moss-bushes to my back, and I made first to come out very hurried, and all choked with a dust of sand and ash. But in a moment I was sane to know that I had come to a sudden hiding-place, and I lay very still and strove neither to cough nor to breathe. And well for me I came to so close a hiding for there were all about me the sounds of monstrous footsteps, running, that seemed to shake the ground, though maybe this to be an imagining bred of my fear. And shoutings of great voices there were, and the thudding of huge feet all about, and the noises of the bushes rustling, but presently the search drew away to the southward, and I perceived that there had surely fought for me some power of good fortune. 
and I came up out of the hole very cautious and shaken and a moment weak with the beating of my heart, yet with a lovely thankfulness for my salvation. And I gat me about and went swift through the moss bushes to the north and west for three hours, and ceased not to run upon my hands and knees. And by that time was I come a great way, and did have a surety in my heart of present safety. And I ceased to run and lay quiet, for in truth I did near swoon away with the hardness of my travel. And indeed, as you shall know, I had slept not for seven and twenty hours, and had scarce ceased to labour in all that time. Moreover, I had not eat neither drunk for nine hours, and so shall you conceive that I was truly aweary. And presently I did slumber there as I lay, and all abroad to any monstrous thing that should come along. Yet did I wake unharmed, and found by my dial there had gone by a full ten hours, the while that I did lie there and sleep unwanting. And I was sore perished with the cold of the night, for I had not the warmth of my cloak about me, and my belly was very empty. And I stood me up and did peer about for any dread matter, but all seemed proper, and I began to stamp my feet against the earth, as that I would drive it from me, and this I do say as a whimsy, and I swung mine arms, as often you do in the cold days, and so I was presently something warmed. And I dismantled my cloak and wrapped it about me, and did feel that the discos was safe to my hip. Then did I sit me down, and did glow a little with relish, in that I should now eat four of the tablets. For indeed these were my proper due, by reason of my shiftless fasting, ere I came so watless to my slumbering. And the memory of that eating doth live with me now, so that I could near to smile. For the eagerness of mine inwards was proper and human. Yet were even four tablets but a little matter to so great an emptiness, and I drank a double portion of the water, that I might make less the void. And this thing was seemly, for indeed there were two portions due unto me. And when I had eaten and drunk, I did fold the cloak once more to shape across my shoulder, as I did carry it, and afterwards I took the discos into my hand and went forward again to the north and west. Yet, as you shall know, I did pause a little in the beginning, and peer to every side for any close danger, and then did look more abroad of that place, but could nowhere see any matter to have me to immediate fear. And afterwards I looked a little while at the monstrous humped back of the Watcher of the Northwest, and it did grow to me how steadfast that thing did look toward the mighty pyramid and this set me to new hatred and horror of the monster, as you shall conceive and believe. And presently I looked beyond the Watcher unto the vast mountain of the Great Redoubt, and I was still seeming close upon it, yet in truth gone a long and weariful distance. But this you shall understand was by the greatness and utter height and bulk of that shining mountain of life. And strange and wonderful it was to me to think that even in that one moment it might be that the dear Master Monstruakin did look upon my face through the great spy-glass, and I should not seem utter far to him by reason of the power of the big glass, but to me, as I did look upward through the night unto that far and utmost light in the upper blackness of the everlasting gloom, it did seem doubly to me that I was afar off and lost forever from mine home and this thinking did breed in me such a great and lonesome feeling, and a weakness of the heart and spirit, that forthwith I took my courage close unto me, and did turn away quickly, and went onward to the north and west, as I have told. Now I walked for twelve hours, and in that time did eat and drink twice, and made onward again very steadfast, and happy that all did go so quiet with me so that it was as if I had at last come to a part of the land that was given over to quietness and lacking of monsters. Yet in truth I was come to a worse place than any may be, for as I went forward, striding very strong and making a good speed, I did hear presently a little noise upward in the night, and some ways unto my left, 
that had seeming as that it were a strange low sound that did come down to me out of an hidden doorway above. For, indeed, though the sound did come from very nigh, as it did seem no more than a score feet above my head, yet was it a noise that did come out of a great and mighty distance, and out of a foreign place. And I did know the sound, though never, as you may suppose, could I have heard it in all my life. Yet had I read in one of the records, and again in a second and a third, how that certain of all they that had adventured from the pyramid into the nightland to seek for knowledge had chanced to hear a queer and improper noise above them in the night. And the noise had been strange, and did come from but a little way upward in the darkness, yet was also from a great and monstrous distance, and did seem to moan and hum quietly, and to have a different sounding from all noises of earth and in the records it was set forth that these were those same doorways in the night, which were told of in an ancient and half-doubted tale of the world, that was much in favour of the children of the pyramid, and not disdained by certain of our wiser men, and had been thus through all the latter ages. And I did seem to know the sound upon the moment, for my heart grew swift to understand, and it was a very dread, uncomfortable sound and you shall know how it did seem, if you will conceive of a strange noise that doth happen far away in the country, and the same noise to seem to come to you through an open door near by. And this was but a poor way to put it, yet how shall I make the thing more known to you, so that I must even trust unto your wit and true sympathy that you shall conceive of the fullness of my meaning? Now in all the histories of those that had adventured into the nightland, there were but three sure records that did concern this sound, and each did tell of a great horror, and of them that did hear the sound, there had died the most part, out in the nightland, and the records did make always that they had come upon destruction, and not simply unto death, but were destroyed by a strange and invisible evil power from the night. And of those that came alive unto the pyramid, they had all one strange tale to tell, how that there were secret and horrid doorways in the night. Yet how this thing could be plain to them, and who may know truly, save it be that the eyes of their spirits did behold that which was hid to the eyes of the flesh. And there was afterwards writ a proper and careful treatise, and did set out that there did be ruptures of the ether, the which did constitute doorways, as those more fanciful ones did name them, and through these shatterings, which might be likened unto openings, there being no better word to their naming, there did come into this particular condition of life those monstrous forces of evil, that did dominate the night, and which many did hold surely to have been given this improper entrance through the foolish and unwise wisdom of those olden men of learning, that did meddle over far with matters that did reach in the end beyond their understanding. And this thing have I told before, and it doth seem proper unto my belief, for it is always thus, and I have that same taint within me, as must all that have the zest of life. Now by this that I have set down swiftly, to make a little clear the sure horridness of this sound, you shall know, even with me, the great horror that did come immediately upon my spirit, and I did know that my search was surely like to have an end in that moment, and I bared mine arm, for my teeth, where the capsule did lie below the skin, and so was ready to an instant death, if that destruction did come upon me. And in the same moment I did fall silent, inward among the moss-bushes, and I did begin to creep very quiet toward the right for, as you will mind, I had heard the sound over beyond my left. And all that time, as I did creep, there was a great sickness upon me, and it did seem that my mouth had weakened unto water, so that I could scarcely hold my teeth tightly from unseemly clitterings. And I crept always very silent, and did often stare quick and painful over my shoulder, upwards, and this way and that, but did never see anything neither could I hear now the sound. And I went this wise for a great hour, 
and was like to faint through the effort of my care and the soreness of my going. But upon the end of that long while I grew something easier in the spirit, and did perceive that I was saved from the destruction that I had come so dreadful anigh. And this thing, it may be, was because that I did chance to hear it, whilst yet it was beyond, and before I did come right unto it to pass below. Yet may I be wrong in this thought, and do but make a guessing. But as I shall here explain, after that time I kept mine ears newly keen unto hearing, and did chide my spirit, for that it had not taken account of that sound a great while earlier. Yet as I did presently conceive, the spirit had no power to hear that thing, which was very strange, but truly so. Now because that I went with a very wary hearing, I heard the sound once a far way off before me, and I hid upon the moment and went backward, and after a while did judge myself to have come unto safety. And so it was in verity, for I heard no more that time. And so did I come presently unto the eighteenth hour, and did eat and drink, and made me a place of slumber in a little hollow of a rock that stood upward out of the moss-bushes. And I slept for six hours, and afterwards waked, and was come to no harm. And after I had eat and drunk again, I did look outward over the night-land, and with particularness to that part that I did travel in, as it might be called, the yesterday. And I did observe it to be a very bleak and desolate country, and not given over to fire or other warmth, nor to sulphur vapours, but to be very quiet and with but a little light in all its breath. And I could conceive that it was no place for anything of life to desire, but rather to avoid, and that country did seem to be yet all about me for I was by no means come clear from it at that time. Though northward there was a glimmer, as of fire-holes, and beyond those the strange shining of the plain of blue fire. And after that I had thought a while, I did believe that I should meet no monster of natural life in all that country of desolation, until I did draw nigh once more unto fire and I conceived that this sound from out of the invisible doorways might yet trouble me, but whether the quietness of that part was because all of natural life did fear the sound, or because that there was neither fire nor warmth, I do not say, having no knowing in this matter. But may yet believe that it was to be laid to both causes, and this doth seem of common reason, as you shall agree. And when I had looked a while unto the mighty pyramid, which was now truly a great way off, for I had walked so many weary hours, I turned me once more to my journeying. And here let me observe that I had gone very far, yet not so distant as might be thought. For oft I did go less than one mile in an hour, or maybe two hours, having to be of great caution, and oft to hide, and to go upon my belly, or to crawl, all as might be. And further, as you may have perceived, I made not a straight forwardness, but did strike this way and that way, being very intent to escape the monsters and evil forces that were all about. Now because that I believed that I travelled in a place where was surely to be discovered those strange doorways within the night, I made an especial care of my going, and did stop oft that I might listen, and watch, and keep a very strict ward in all the night about me. Yet, as you shall see, this served not to prevent me from going forward into the fearfulness of that which did haunt all the void, for sudden, as I went carefully, I heard a faint humming noise come downward from the night a little unto my rear, and the humming noise did grow more plain, as that a door were opened slowly above, and did let out that sound ever more loud. And surely, after I did hear that, I could not doubt that a door were opened upward there. For the noise did grow in such wise as you shall hear a distant sound come through, when a door truly is oped. For if the noise had been made just in that place, it had seemed to come from there. But this sound, though it did come through there, was as that it did come outward from some far lost and foreign eternity. And this I do struggle always to make plain and you shall not blame me that I think overmuch upon it. For in truth there was an horror so wondrous and drear about it that I can forget not, 
but do strive always that others should know with me that peculiar woe and terror that did haunt the night. Now, as you will see, I had in truth gone past the place where the doorway in the night did open, yet had come to no harm, but rather it did seem that it opened by chance, unwotting that I was anigh or it may be that my quiet passing did disturb an evil power, so that it did even come to listen, or to make search. And all this doth pass through my brain, as I do write, and it doth seem to me that my thoughts are but the thoughts of a little child, before so great a mystery, and that I touch not even the edge and fringe of the truth with my thinkings, and so do cease upon them, and will go but forward so plain as I may with my telling. Now, as you may truly believe, when I heard that sound, and did understand that I had, in verity, come past beneath that place, I did surely sicken to an utter weakness of body and heart, though it was but for a moment, and then I was swift hid within the close shelter of the low and thick moss-bushes. And I shook in all my being, and crept, shaking, upon my hands and knees, and did near totter to my face thrice, so weak gone was I in that moment of terror, and I did have a wickedness of forgetting in that time, for I bared not mine arm to have the capsule to a readiness for my death, if that did need to be, and this was an abominable foolishness, and I do shake now when I think upon it, for death is but a little matter by the side of destruction, though in truth dreadful enough for all. Yet, as it did chance, no harm came to me, and I gat away, as that some wondrous power did cast a viewless cloak about me, that I might be utter hid, and oft have I wondered whether this was truly so, but having no knowing. And presently I ceased from fleeing, and had some calmness, and did eat and drink, and so came to the comfort of a firm spirit, the which had been sore troubled above all understanded causes, by that horrid sounding upward in the night. And after that I had eat and drunk, and did rest a little, but afterward went onward to the northward, going towards that place where the fire-holes did glimmer, the same being by this time no great way off. Then as I did come anigh, I thought to hear once again the sound in the night, and I stopped very swift, and hid into the moss-bushes, and did listen, but did hear not, and was so hopeful that fancy did play upon me. Yet, because of this matter, I went upon my hands and knees for a good way, and so came at last nigh unto the shine of one of those fire-holes, the which I did see for so long. Now, as you shall suppose, I went very cautious through the bushes unto that red shining fire, being careful, both that I did attract not any evil force that might listen in the night, and because that there might be some monster nigh to the fire-hole. But presently, when I was come so that I could peer through the bushes, I did see a little fire-hole set in a small hollow, and there did no thing seem to lurk an eye. And the sight of that warmth did cheer me, for it was long since I did have the comfort of such a matter. And when I had lain hid a while, that I might watch all about, I saw the place to be safe and quiet, and I went out from the moss-bushes, and sat down a space from the fire, which did fill the pit in which it did lift and bubble. And the noise that it sent out was strange and slow, and it did seem to gruntle gently unto itself in that lonesome hollow, as that it had made a long and quiet grumbling there through eternity and oft was it still and made no sound, and again would give an odd bubbling in the quietness, and send off, as it did seem, a little smoke of sulphur, and afterward fall once more upon a quiet. And so I did sit there very hushed and restful, and the loneliness did lie all about me, and the red shine of the fire-hole did glow soft in the hollow, and I was glad to be quiet, for my heart was weary and there was to my back a little rock that did jut upward so high as a man, and the rock was warm and pleasant to lean upon, and moreover did seem to guard me from behind. And there I ate and drunk, and kept very still, and so was presently rested. And this I did need, as you have perceived, 
for I was gone sudden weary of the heart, as I did say, and this might be because that I did never cease to have destruction over me to companion my way, though, as you will mind, I had been no more than twelve hours afoot since my last sleeping. Yet I doubt not you do understand. And presently my heart grew strong again within me, and I had a warmth in my spirit. And I got up from the earth and stretched out mine arms, and I saw that my gear was safe upon me, and afterward did grip the discos, as it were newly. Then I went away from the fire-hole and climbed the far slope of the hollow and went northward, and there were before me many of the fire-holes, for I did perceive them to shine in the night for a great way, as it did seem that they were a path of red shinings that led me onward to the northwest of the light of the plain of blue fire. Now I had a believing that I had come out of the country where did lurk those horrid doorways in the night and I went not with so utter a weight upon my heart, and did feel that naught should come now upon the back of my neck, which had been an odd and troublesome fancy, whilst that I did creep through that country of gloom. Yet, as you shall know, I went with no foolish confidence, but with a great caution, and mine hearing keen to hark, and a care to my steps, and did ever watch around me as I journeyed and because that I went forward in this proper and sedate manner, I had great cause for a thankful heart, as you may perceive, for I had come after a long way to another of those hollows where did burn one of the fire-holes, and I made a pause upon the edge of the hollow in which it did lie, and looked downward, keeping guarded within the moss-bushes, where they grew anigh to the top thereof. But there was no living thing there to be seen, and I went downward, so that I should warm my body at the fire. And lo, as I stood upon this side of the fire-hole and turned myself about, I looked presently more keenly to the other side, for the yellowness of the earth did seem a little strange in one place. But I could see with no plainness, because that there arose a glare from the fire against mine eyes. And I went round that I should look the better, yet with no fear or thought of evil in my heart. And truly, when I was come upon that far side of the fire-hole, lo, there was spread out in the yellow sand of that place a curious thing. And I went more nigh, and stooped to look upon it. And behold, it moved, and the sand all about did move for a great space, so that I gave back very swift, and swung upward with the discos. And strangely, I heard the sand to stir at my back, and I looked round very quick and the sand rose upward in parts, and sifted back, and there came to my sight odd things that did move and curl about. And immediately, before I knew which way to go, I knew that the sand did shift under my feet, and did work and heave, so that I was tottered and was shaken also in the heart, for I knew not what to think in that instant. Then did I perceive that I was all surrounded and I ran swift upon the heaving sand unto the edge of the fire-hole, and I turned there and looked quickly, for I did not know what this new terror should be. And I saw that a yellow thing did hump upward from out of the sand, as it had been a low hillock that did live, and the sand shed downward from it, and it did gather to itself strange and horrid arms from the sand all about it, and it stretched two of the arms unto me but I smote with the discos, and I smote thrice, and afterward they did wriggle upon the sand. But this was not the end as I did hope, for the yellow thing arose and ran at me, as it might be that you should see a spider run, and I did leap backward, this way and that, but the monster had a great swiftness, so that I did seem surely lost. Then I made a strong and instant resolve, for I perceived that I had no hope to slay this thing, save that I should come at it in the body, and I put everything to the chance, and made not to escape any more, but ran straight in among the legs, and there were great hairs like to spines upon the legs, and these had pricked me to the death, but that the armor saved me. Now I had done this thing with a wondrous quickness, so that I was under the mighty arching of the legs before the yellow thing did what of my intent. And the body was bristled with the great hairs, 
and poison did seem to come from them and to ooze from them strangely in great and shining drops, and the monster heaved itself up to one side that it might bring certain of the legs inward to grasp me, yet in that moment did I smite utter fierce with the discos, thrusting. And the discos did spin and hum and roar and sent out a wondrous blaze of flame as that it had been a devouring death and it sundered the body of the yellow thing, and did seem as that it screamed to rage amid the entrails thereof, so wondrous was the fury and energy of that trusted weapon. And I was covered with the muck of the thing, and the claws upon the legs seized me, so that the grey armour did bend and crack to the might thereof, and I grew sick unto death with the pain within, but smote with the shining discus, using my left hand weakly for my right was gripped dreadful fast to my body. And lo, I was sudden free, and a great blow did knock me far across the hollow, so that I was like to have fallen into the fire-hole, but fell instead upon the edge and came backward unto safety. And I turned me about, and the yellow thing did throw the sand all ways as it did die, but had lost power to come upon me. And for my part I lay weak upon the earth, and was no more able to fight, nor could I do more than breathe for a great while, but yet came presently to health and made to examine my hurts. Then I saw there was no great wound anywhere upon me, but only an utter bruising, and I found upon my right leg that there was a sharp and hairy claw clipped about it, but the armour had saved me from harm of the horrid thing so that I did but kick it free with my left foot, and thence into the fire-hole. Now by this time that monstrous creature was dead, but I held off from it and went upon the other side of the fire, for I was yet surely in horror of it, and I sat for a time and did think upon all matters that did concern me, and I saw that I should have not comfort of heart until I was washed clean from the taint of the monster and I get me up wearily to go forth into the night again, that I should make a search for a hot spring, of which I had come past many. And I had oft found them to be nigh unto the fire-holes, so that I was trustful that I should see one ere long. And, lo, there was a little hollow just beyond, and a scarce a hundred paces off, and in the hollow there did shine three small fire-holes, and there was a steaming puddle, as did seem, beyond the third of the holes. Now before I had ventured downward into this place, I went all about the topmost edge, and made a search of the moss-bushes about, but found naught that should scare me. And afterward I went all across the hollow, but did find no monstrous thing hid anywheres. Yet there was that in the place that discouraged me, and did keep me from stripping mine armor so that I should bathe in the hot puddle. For I stepped upon a small serpent, and the same did lap about my leg, but could do me no hurt, for the armour, which was a very blessed protection. And I freed myself from it with the handle of the discos. And because that I could not go naked to my cleansing, I tried first the hotness of the water, which was not over great, and afterward to take off the scrip and the pouch and the cloak and laid them with the discos upon the edge of the warm puddle. Then I stepped into the water, and was immediately gone downward a great way, for truly it was no puddle as I had supposed, but a deep well, as you might call it, of hot and sulphury water. And this doth show how a man may act foolishly, even when he doth believe he hath a great caution and surely it is borne in upon me afresh that none should trust over freely into unproven matters, the which shall you hardly agree with, but yet do as foolishly according to your lights and characters. And so shall you laugh not over hardly upon me. Now I had gone over the head, and surely I do not know what deepness was there. Yet, as you shall think, I stayed not to consider upon this matter, but made to climb out, and much shaken with my splutterings and the smarting of mine eyes, for truly the water was strong with sulphur matters. Yet very cleansing was it, as I did presently see, for there was no more any taint or horridness upon mine armour, or the flesh of my face or hands. 
and I took the discos and washed it clean also, and then the cloak, and afterward the scrip and the pouch, and the bands of the same. And after I had done this I was minded to dry myself by the little fire-holes, but when I was come there, lo, maybe a score small serpents were about those places, and I was strongly pleased that I should keep away. Yet that I must warm and dry me in that desolate and bitter nightland, you shall agree. And to this end I put the scrip and the pouch upon me, and afterwards took the discos readily into my hand, and ran quietly unto the hollow, where I did fight with the yellow thing. And the cloak I bore in my left hand. Now when I was got there I was truly glad to think that there were no serpents in that place. And because that I had slain the monster of the place, how should it be that any harm might come unto me? For truly was it not like that a creature of such might should keep all that hollow unto himself, and slay any that did come therein, and thereby preserve that place from all other horror? Though surely, until it did die and cease to be, there had been no call for any greater abomination. Now all this did go through my brain, as I did sit to dry mine armor and my body and my gear, upon that side of the fire-hole which was away from the slain monster. And I made presently to think that this would be a sure and proper refuge wherein to sleep. For truly it must have gotten a place where none other creature should be like to come to work me harm. And it must be that you do all see with me in this matter, and commend me that I thought with properness. And so did I resolve that I put my disgust within my pocket, as we do say, and stay safe and quiet within that hollow. And this thing I did surely, and did eat and drink, and presently I went over to the dead monster and made very sure that it was truly slain, which indeed it was. And after that I had seen to this matter I returned unto the fire-hole, and made a comfortable place in the sand for my rest, for I was well dry by this. And I wrapped the cloak about me and took the discos to my breast, for a sure companion, as it had truly proved in my need. And I could think almost that it did nestle unto me, as that it knew and loved me, but this thing can be no more than a fancy, and I do but set it down as such, and that it doth show my feeling and mind at that time. Then ere I did compose myself to slumber, I looked about me, upward to the edges of the hollow, and I perceived that I was lost to the sight of the mighty pyramid. For I was come so far off that it looked not down from so wondrous a height as you shall perceive, and moreover the hollow was something deep. And afterward, as I lay my head back upon the scrip and the pouch, which were to me my pillow, I went to think a little upon Nani, as always I did in my constant journeying, yet presently I strove sometimes that I put her from my mind, that I should sleep for a bitter sorrow and anxiousness was oft upon me when that I did think upon her, and this you may know, for truly I knew not what terror was come to her, afar in the silence of the night. And did I think over much, I should feel that I could have no calmness needful to sleep, but to need to walk for ever until I died, which could not be long, and so should I make a foolishness of mine anxious journeying to do her true service and to save her from destruction, if such did truly threaten. And I was soon gone over to sleep, and waked not for seven hours, being much weary by the fight and the soreness of my body, the which did put me into a great pain as I did rise upward from my slumber. But this was presently something less, and I eat two of the tablets and drank some of the water and afterward did put my gear upon me, and went forward into the night, having the discos in my hand. And my heart was glad that I had come safe through the time of my sleep. End of chapter 7, part 2